to right field. Marquez is going back. It's over. It's hard and off the scoreboard. The Phillies are going to win the ball game. A two-run base hit by Franco. The other way, and they win it by a final of four to three. And I don't know if they'll chase it. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 13th episode of the Drive Podcast. I am Kyle Fry, and as always, I'm joined by Jared Paolo. And Jared, before we even start, what is your Eagles win-loss prediction? Oh wow, this is just like thrown at me. I, I did not expect that. <laughs> um, I'll, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna say nine and seven. I'm gonna say twelve and four because fuck it, I don't care anymore. Oh wow, <laughs> I, look, twelve like, and four. Amps. There's some games on there where, like for sure. They could if they if they win like a few of these games like there's just a game against the Seahawks in there I believe there's because we have the um, the West this year so yeah there's games in there that if they if they could take some of those like up for grab games against like some mediocre or not mediocre but like above average teams like there's a there's a chance but I don't know I'll say a modest seven nine and seven <clears throat> I'm just kind of like joking with mine because I have it's. I'm mostly just making fun of the fact that people actually are doing win-loss projections in in April <laughs> before the draft has even started because yeah. NFL fans. <laughs> yeah, it's way too but, early. Uh, but, you know. Yeah. So early. It's sports. It's sports. <laughs> what do you expect? It, yeah. It's, you can't control these people. Uh, <laughs> but before we even yeah. get into football, which, yeah, we're getting into football today. It's like the first time we've talked about football since the Super Bowl, probably. Probably, <laughs> I think yeah. It's yeah, but uh, we're just going to talk a little bit about the NBA and NHL playoffs, and then, like I said, we're going to get into the Eagles' schedule and just some possibilities on who they're going to draft, and then we're going to get into, obviously, the main topic of the podcast, which is, of course, the Phillies, and how they have gone, how they have been 6-9 and nine on 420 for two years in a row, Amazing. therefore the nicest team in the MLB. Mm-hmm. Very nice, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No team is ever gonna do that again, and it's amazing. <laughs> like, oh yeah, two how? years in a row. Like we all remember, we all remember what happened last year. Like when they started six and nine on four twenty, and then they had like one of the greatest. They had, they had like an overperforming first month, and then you know, Cam Rupp had to play the plate and everything. <laughs> and yeah, yes, yeah, very. Everything true. was awesome. It was. It was. For, and then and then yeah, and then uh, yeah, rebuilding <laughs> Phillies happened. So. But, uh, again, Phillies are last, but... <laughs> yeah, we'll uh, So the NHL and NBA playoffs have started, and best thing in the entire world happened last night. The Chicago Blackhawks swept in the first round of the playoffs by the National Predators. And, sorry, Patrick Kane, you know, you're not moving on. There's only <laughs> one Predator moving on now. Oh, yeah. As of that... <laughs> I had to, yeah, I had to you, use the tweet. You had to use it, yeah. I, I, was, I had a feeling that you were going to use it, but I wasn't going to say anything. I was going to ask you if you'd seen it. But <laughs> I figured you already did, so I just I didn't waste my time. I saw that, and I, that immediately made my day. Which, <laughs> if there are any Blackhawks fans listening to this, which I don't know why there would be, but you might be listening to us. I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm not sorry. I have no apologies whatsoever. Yeah, really. We don't have, we don't have anything against your team. It's just we hate your team pretty much because you're the Blackhawks. Yeah. So. And we don't like and Patrick, Patrick Kane. Patrick Kane. You know, he's a, yeah. yeah. He's a dirtbag. And we don't yeah. just mean for 2010. Yeah. This isn't yeah, about 2010. Yeah, definitely not just this for is... 2010. This is about, yeah. But, <laughs> but yeah, the, the Blackhawks getting swept is obviously always fun because they beat us in 2010 like we just mentioned in the, uh, in the Stanley Cup final. So that sucked. But, you know, um, I don't know. And what was funny, because, like, we were talking about before, like, every single ESPN quote-unquote analyst that they picked to, like, choose the, um, choose, like, their brackets and choose, like, who was going to win, obviously, like, you know, the whole shebang. But they all picked the Blackhawks in, I think, either six or seven. There was no, nobody yeah. had, nobody oh, there had was, Nashville. There was one person who put five. <clears throat> One person who had okay, so like they literally all had Chicago in the first round, and there was I think more than ten of them. There was like twelve people, I think. Yeah, it was it was something. There was a decent amount of people who were just like, nope, Nashville has no chance. Yeah, like I, I don't know, like I I didn't really, 
Um, I didn't do, like, the bracket challenge like you guys did. Like, because I saw, like, everybody post them. And I was going to do it, but then I kind of forgot about it. And then I was like, oh, I don't even know where, where I would do this. Um, I it's it okay. NHL.com like, NHL. is so confusing, so. so. Um, yeah, I kind of just forgot about it, honestly. But, I don't know. I, pr- I probably would have picked Chicago just just because they're Chicago and it's the playoffs and, you know. But, you know, good for Nashville. It proves pretty much everybody wrong except themselves, but, yeah. Even then, I feel like they're a little bit surprised. Like, I picked Nashville to win, which, but, okay, I picked Nashville to win, but I picked them in seven. Nashville swept them. Like, no one would have predicted that. It wasn't even close. Like, no, they they didn't score. Like, Chicago didn't score, what, in the first two games? Yeah, yeah, Pegrine had back-to-back shutouts, and then... Yeah, and... Only... <laughs> and funny enough, Blackhawks slogan or whatever for the playoffs, and I think even the whole year or whatever, was one like goal. one goal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, about that. <laughs> <laughs> you probably you you got scored it. like one goal in the whole series. Pretty much, but. You achieved your goal, Chicago. <laughs> you got one. <laughs> yeah, and, uh... But, you know, and then, uh, and then Calgary, they lost as well to uh, Anaheim. They got swept. Um... And then, which I did not expect. Yeah, the, I didn't really expect that either. I, I expected at least Calgary to take. I don't. I, I don't know if I would have expected Calgary to win the series, but get, take a take two games or so. But you know that that was. A but sweep like you as said well. before we started recording, like they made it close, like every game. It wasn't. Oh yeah, that like, like that could have yeah, been Nashville a Nashville. That could have been a but... sweep. Yeah, oh yeah, for sure. Like Calgary could have swept Anaheim. Like that could have been a, a complete opposite series, a completely different series. But it just so happened that, you know, the bounces went in Anaheim's favor and they swept them 4-0. But, like, every single one of those games were close. <clears throat> yeah, and that's just the way of the playoffs. It's every, like, the Toronto-Washington series has been a great example of that. Last night's game, or, uh, not last night's game, to the last game of the series uh, was the first game of the series that didn't go to overtime. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get just a little taste of how crazy that series has been. Yeah, the the least caps that that has been a pretty good series, and like you, I, I, you look at it on paper and you look at like all these people or all the players from Toronto making their like playoff series debuts, and then you look at Washington and they were they dominated the regular season like they have done in recent years, and they get to the playoffs and you look at it like holy like Washington should kill them. They have they have the experience, they have the talent. They have the leadership, they have the coaching, and then they're tied 2-2 with a team that pretty much, like, has half their team is rookies, so, like. But that's the thing, like, <clears throat> coming into the series, and um, the Steve Dangle podcast has mentioned this a lot, the Leafs have been playing with house money the whole time. Mm-hmm. Like, they have all, they have no pressure is even if they lose, so what? You weren't expected to make the playoffs this year anyway. No yeah. one really cares if you lose. But if you win, like if I don't think people really understand how big a Leafs series win would be for the entire league. Because the Capitals have like no cap room. So they don't win the cup this year. What happens? Like you're seeing TJ Oshi probably leave at some point. You're seeing a lot of trades happen and the entire league is, is gonna get shaken up by that. Oh yeah, and Ovechkin. Like, how how long did the Caps say? How do we try to keep winning with with Ovechkin as the core, or do we try to shake it up? Because, and I'm not even saying like Ovechkin should be traded, but how much longer till the Caps start thinking, holy shit, like we're running out of time, and that this is their last really best chance because of the cap situation that they have. <clears throat> so, the Leafs again, they're playing with house money. It doesn't mean they're going to win the series. But you can see it in just this game so far in the series. They've been relaxed as all hell, and Washington is just... You can tell that the pressure is there in them. Oh, yeah, definitely. And, like, because it goes back, like, with the pressure. And, like, how you are saying before with Ovechkin, like, do they do they continue with them? Do they shake it up? Because it it's every year now. It, it, everybody expects them to just dominate the regular season and go into the playoffs, and it's every year. It's, oh, this is the year, this is the year. And every single year, they just they just lose in like the first two rounds, and you just gotta wonder like, can they can they pull through the next level with Ovechkin there, kind of as that 
I, I don't even know if they would call it a mental block, but there's some, there's something happening that just like whenever the playoffs come around, the Capitals just like turn into a like they just a shell. forget how to play hockey half the time, and then the other half that they remember they play well and they win games, but they just can't do it more like consistent enough to where they win series. Yeah, and it's one of the greatest... Like, I don't think people really understand how crazy it is that in Ovechkin's career, which started in 05-06, the year after the lockout, they have not gone past the second round. They still have not been to the conference finals. Like, they haven't even gotten a chance to play for the cup yet. (coughs) And that's insane. Like, this is one of the greatest scorers and one of the greatest players in NHL history. Like, this is a guy who... I don't know if it's going to happen, and it's still a long shot that it will, but this is a guy who still has a decent shot of catching Gretzky's goal record. Like, it's not that crazy of a thought, <laughs> mm. and I know that sounds crazy, but it's... Look at the numbers. It's He's not... If he he's can not, keep up his, his pace, if he, if, yeah, he's if got he a shot. His pace and then, yeah, like... Like, just like the caliber of... His, like, the, te- the caliber of a player such as Alexander Ovechkin... Uh, and then you go into the playoffs, and it just it just falls apart. Not only him, but like his whole team and his whole staff and everything just seemingly collapses. It's just you just gotta wonder like what's going on. Like, is it just like a mental block? Is it is it something within the within the team that they're not doing right? You just who knows. Yeah, it is. It is one of the greatest mysteries of this generation of hockey, and. To think their first playoff loss was against the Flyers <laughs> in 07 08 yeah. with Joffrey Lupul getting the game seven goal. <laughs> oh, yeah. To think it all started with the Flyers. Yep. Because, of course, everything starts with the Flyers. Yep, but, um, but also going on, uh, because the NHL and the NBA are like the same thing, um, the playoffs <laughs> for the NBA are going on as well. They started a little bit after the NHL playoffs started, so they're, I think they're like halfway through the series is right now. Um, so nobody has, re- nobody has been knocked out yet. Uh, there are teams up in the series, like, like Cleveland's up 3-0 over the Pacers. They came back from, what, 25 down, LeBron went bananas, uh, in the fourth, or the th- end of the third into the fourth, and throughout the fourth, and they came back and won. Um, Harden and the Rockets are up over... Russ and the and the Thunder, uh, a lot of people like people are like, oh, like this is like oh, like this is where the MVP is gonna be. No, like the MVP is already decided. Like, it's yeah, it's, it's love, a regular season thing. So, I love those people so much. Yeah, yeah. The the playoffs don't have any implications on the MVP, and I, that's why I wish the uh, the MLB would just announce it before the end of the season because you just have so many people who like. Just for instance, the year that Howard won the MVP in 06, everyone's like, well, whose team didn't make the playoffs? Pujols won the World Series. It's like, yeah, it's it's a regular season thing. Mm-hmm. Please shut up. Yeah, like, I don't know. I, I It's been, like, all over the place. I've been watching it on, like, ESPN. Like, ESPN's have it on. Like, they're debating on it, like, first take. Like, should there be, you know, just one MVP award like there is now? Should there be regular season, a playoffs, a finals, like, he's got, like, and I don't know, <laughs> I, I just, I kind of like how it is now, like, I don't really have a problem with it. But, yeah, I don't either, yeah. it's, just keep it the way it is, the, the people who, like, there are, um, <coughs> I forget if the NBA does, like, an Eastern Conference Finals MVP, or a West, like, a West Finals MVP, I don't know if they do that, um, if, if they don't, don't they so. should, just because, yeah. like, what's, like, they, they, um, MLB does it. Like you might as well. It's not it, because the the conference finals are more important than just like the first round like, in a way. Yeah. Like, I, they're all important, obviously, but it's the round that gets you to the finals. So, oh, it, yeah. It, there's no point in changing it. It's fine the way it is. Yeah, and then like you know, there's other series like the some series like that. I think I believe the Bucks and the Raptors are there. Tied or maybe the um, Bucks Milwaukee are up leads two one. Two one. Two yeah. one. Okay, yeah, that's what somehow because I because thought. I, I remember last night. Okay, yeah, they they spanked them last night. I think, but uh, but yeah, the, the Warriors, Bulls lead the Celtics. <laughs> the Bulls, yeah, the Bulls up on the Celtics. 
Uh, the Warriors are leading. Even without KD, they demolished. Uh, they demolished whoever they're. I don't even know who they're playing. Uh, Portland. <laughs> Portland. Yeah, the Portland stands no chance, pretty much. Um, yeah. And then, and then uh, the Grizzlies coach. <laughs> Did you see, uh, did you see like the the rant he had about the refs? Um, I did not. Wait, what is you this? Didn't, um, so after game two, I believe it was the Grizzlies coach went on a, a rant, pretty much saying like about how many free throws um, the Spurs had versus how many free throws his team had, and like how like aggressive. Because obviously everybody knows like Mike Conley is a pretty aggressive player. Uh, Zach Randolph, he's a pretty aggressive player. Like some of the guys that are on the on the Grizzlies are like aggressive players. Marcus All and um, like they were not getting calls apparently that he thought that they should get, and the Spurs were getting ticky tacky calls that you know could not have been called but were, and uh, he went on a rant at his post game press conference and he was like, he's like take that for data and then he got up and left so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well then, <laughs> the, yeah. the sauce is real. Yeah, but. Yeah, the Spurs. I, I'm pretty sure they're up two one in that series. I don't see them losing. Um, yeah, you know. Yeah. Who it doesn't? You know, we you know, this year. I don't really care too much about the playoffs. I'm like every year. I'm really just like you know whatever about the NBA playoffs until the Sixers make it next year, which they're going to because yeah. <laughs> they're going to, like to, they're the Sixers. Like they're going to be the two seed probably next year. No, but one seed, Jared. Uh, one seed. One could hope. One could hope. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I don't. I don't really mind. I'm just gonna watch. I I just hope Golden State doesn't win, and like I wouldn't yeah. be mad if like any other team. I wouldn't be mad if they won. Like it's gonna be. Really you know, it's gonna be either the Warriors, the Cavs, the Spurs, and that's like it. Because no other team is good enough. I really hope that somehow Westbrook <clears throat> just leads the Thunder to the finals, just to be like fuck you, KD. <laughs> if he does that, like if they he, if he ends up bringing it back against the Rockets and then just, like, powers to the West, I don't know. Like, you gotta wonder, like, if this is, like, the single greatest season for a, a player in in the history of the league, so. It very well could be if he manages that, and it still even might be just the way it is because of how great he's been. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, you know, the two playoffs are going on right now, so we'll have to wait and see, obviously. They don't end for another almost two months, I believe. Like, they both end... Yeah. Well, the NHL, I think, ends in the beginning of June, and then, like, the NBA ends in, like, the second week of June, so. Yeah, the NBA is, you like, know. just a week or two later, but we'll have yeah. a bigger, like, recap or whatever of things when the series end. Like, next week, I think most of the series should for be over, both at least. leagues should be over, so we'll yeah. have a bigger recap then. Yeah. But uh, to move on to our, you know, our actual Philadelphia teams today, um, we got the <laughs> Eagles and the Phillies, so we'll start out with the Eagles. <laughs> um, so the draft is coming up. Uh, it's April twenty seventh to the twenty ninth. It's being held in Philadelphia, which is always cool because you know I- I'm not sure if you've seen. Have you seen the uh, the like, the recreations and like the what the what it's gonna look like? I've seen just little bits and pieces. <clears throat> I haven't seen like that much of it, but yeah, it looks nice. It's yeah, and Philly always does a really good job of getting these things together. I know back when the Oh, excuse me, the Flyers held the draft a few years ago. I think it was like 2014 or something. It was really awesome there. And it's, of course, it's Philly, so it's going to be at the Rocky Steps, which... Always. Just, of course. Of course it's going to be at the Rocky Steps, because that's all Philadelphia is known for. Yeah. But, uh... <laughs> <coughs> but yeah, yeah, so to, so, um... Yeah, to, to kind of talk about who the Eagles might draft, um... So, you know, there's... We all know the Eagles need a, a running back. We need some some defensive help, uh, in the the cornerback safety. You know, we we need we need some skill position players. We need we need some help. We need some we need a little bit of help. So we need help. Yeah, to put it kind of just you know simply, but um, so there are <laughs> I you probably couldn't count how many mock drafts there were right now. Um, because oh, it's, everybody it's so and their mothers have been doing mock drafts for the last three months, so, um. It's just, like, an overflow of mock drafts, yeah. and I hate to say it, but I'm doing one, like, right now. Like, I'm doing that, <laughs> the NFL draft game or whatever. Yeah. I, I've, like, picked the pick that picked 
back up that addiction as I fail to use words. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I've been using that a lot now, and I just really hope every time that I do this that I see Reuben Foster available when the Eagles are up, because I'm just like, give me Reuben Foster, please, <laughs> for the love of God, let him fall to the Eagles. Yeah, so... um so there, there are a few options. Well, there are more than a few. There's a lot of options. Obviously, we're not going to take a quarterback. We're not going to take. Um, we're pro- we're more than likely not going to take like a like a Mike. Well, if Mike Williams dropped to us, we'd probably take him. But he's not going to drop to us. He'll probably go top ten, um, if I had to guess. But um, the the Eagles are probably going to end up taking. A cornerback. If I had to, if I, if I was betting on who they would take, on what position they would draft, it would have to be either a cornerback or a safety. Just because the the top two, well, two of the top um, cornerbacks in the draft are um, they're both from out of Ohio State. Marshawn Lattimore, who's probably gonna go top five, and uh, Malik Hooker. Sorry, not Malik Hooker. Um, uh, Gary on Conley. Um, Hooker's a Hooker is a uh, safety, but um, Conley and Lattimore—they're probably both going to go in the top. Pro- uh, I'd say probably ten to fifteen, but you know, you, you never know. It, they could drop if, if um, especially if Conley drops. Lattimore probably not, but if if Conley drops, at, and we have we can get him at fourteen. I'll take him at fourteen, but um, you know, then obviously Christian McCaffrey and. And if Reuben Foster, like you said, is there, I want to take him. Yeah, definitely. Like, <clears throat> I think, I think I probably have like an unpopular opinion here with Eagles fans. But if it comes down to Foster or Conley, or really, um, like unless Lattimore is there at fifteen, which he's not going to be, there's literally no chance of that unless something happens in the next week that just severely his ruins his draft, like draft status. Yeah. Like it would have to be like. Bad. I can't even like think of to, what it would be. Like it'd have to be um, uh, who who was it last year that was like caught with the with the with the gas oh, mask or whatever. Shit. Yeah. I I forget his name, but yeah. yeah it'd exactly. Be, it'd have it, to it be, would have to be something bad. like that. Yeah. Yeah. It would have to, and yeah, it would have to be like right at the draft mm-hmm. too, because I think if you gave it like any time, it would just people would be like, yeah, but it's Lattimore. <laughs> like <Yeah. laughs> eh, I don't really care. <laughs> like unless it's like a rape charge or something, which. Please don't. There's two. We already have a Joe Mixon in this <laughs> draft class, so please just yeah. Don't just, do anything stupid, yeah, just guys. Wait. Just, just don't. Wait, just wait till after the draft. Jeez. <laughs> or or just don't do it at all. Yeah, don't That's... do it at all. Don't do it at all. Um, but yeah, it, I would just want them to take Foster over everyone. I think at this point, I know a lot of people are on um, like like you said, Mike Williams is a target. Uh, Corey Davis, if he drops to us. John Ross. Um, John Ross is there, but I, I there's so many receivers in this draft class too. They're like there is so much depth at like every single position. There is. Like I, this is one of the better drafts. I can't in imagine. Memory. Like yeah, there's not that there's not that like start like Miles Garrett is obviously really good, but like yeah, you usually there's always like that top five like star studded, but like even like you look at all these mock drafts and past one, I don't think there's any. To, uh, there's not like a single mock draft where every single person who is in the draft uh, who's in the mock draft has the same pick. Like it's all different. Like the draft, like there's not that like star-studded top of the first round lineup this year. But there are some really good people at the top of the first. There are some stars, but like past ten or five. Like, there's, like, it's all just, like, insanely good depth. Like, you have some people who are being drafted in the top 15, and then on other people's, they're getting bumped almost to the second round. Like, they're, like, the the the, the depth and just, like, the overall um, variation of the depth is, like, in- incredible in this draft. So, like, you can get a really solid player... Probably up until like the fourth round, and then like obviously after that, you know, it gets down to the just the ticky tacky stuff. But really, yeah. it's, it's like just, at that point, it's yeah. it's kind of just how good your scouting is. But I know a lot of people in this draft have wanted um, Christian McCaffrey from Stanford, 
And I get it. I really do. But at the same time, there are so many running backs. Like, Kareem Hunt is the guy that I really want. Mm. And a guy who's probably going to be there with our third round pick. Who, mm. he's he's out of Toledo. And I know a lot of people are going to be like, oh, well, he didn't face any competition. Shut the hell up. That doesn't, like, that whole theory of, oh, well, he has to play in the SEC if he's actually a good player. No, that's that's just not true. Yeah, exactly. Like, it helps. Like, Corey Davis went to Western Michigan, and, like, he's a projected top ten pick. Exactly. Carson once went to North Dakota State. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Like, it's, it doesn't matter. It's not that big of an issue as people make it out to be. Yeah. So, I really like Kareem Hunt. Uh, there's another guy, Jamal Williams, from BYU. I haven't watched a lot of his uh, game tape, but I've seen a little bit, and he, again... Seems like a really good piece that they could probably pick up around, like, third or fourth round. Um, that, uh, I think his name is Donta Foreman from Texas, who's, like, a freaking tank. Like, he is huge. <laughs> and uh, I think they, I think his draft stock has gone, like, really high. Because whenever I do, like, the NFL draft game thing, like, he's never there past, like, the second round. Mm. So, yeah. <laughs> apparently, everyone realized that he is a huge huge human being and he's probably going to just run over every single person that tries to tackle him yeah so <laughs> yeah and then but obviously there's always the possibility of a trade down or a trade up um of course but i don't i don't know i don't necessarily see a a trade if anywhere they might go as if if they were to trade up i don't see them going anywhere past 11 10 at the most like, yeah 10 would be pushing it um and the same, if they're gonna if they're gonna go down, I don't see them going anywhere past twenty. So expect pretty much them to be in the ten to twenty range, if at all they draft, or if they trade a, a pick. But um, I don't really expect it because if you if they trade up, then that's kind of an indication that they're gonna they're gonna make a run at either one of the like one of the top cornerbacks or safeties for that matter. Um, but if they trade down then you know that they're hopefully going to wait out and see if McCaffrey or Dalvin Cook uh, is there at around like the late teens, early 20s, possibly if they trade that far, which I don't think they will. Um, then, that's what probably, that, then that would probably be their strategy if they traded down. Um, and then with their later round picks, they could grab uh, still some solid defensive backs because, like we said, the depth is unreal. So... Um, so yeah, you know, there's a lot to look forward to in the draft. Uh, it'll be fun, it'll be a, a fun time. Obviously, it, I always like watching the draft. Like people are always like, "Oh, how do you sit there and watch 32 picks in like four hours?" It's like I don't know. Like it's it's just fun. Like it, it's just a, an entertaining thing. It's for just, me. I don't know. It's one of those things with the NFL. It's just something that we all just kind of mindlessly watch. Like this is amazing. Mel Kiper's hair is so magnificent. <laughs> yeah. That's why we watch it. But, uh, exactly. That's the only reason <laughs> anyone watches it. But no, it's going to be fun this year with, um, as soon as the Cowboys get their pick, there's, they're not going to be able to, they're not going to be able to announce the pick. It's just going to be booze for, like, oh, yeah. 24 hours straight after oh, that. Oh, yeah. Well, it's <laughs> like, if the Cowboys don't pick a, a defensive back, then they're dumb, but they're going to, so. You know. Yeah. The Cowboys are, Cowboys are many things, but they, they are they're pretty good teams, in so. Philadelphia. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, also some Eagles news. Uh, the schedule got released, which Jesus Christ, NFL Network had like a two-hour special or something for the schedule release. Why? Well, why? Why is this so important? Who knows? I, I just, I really don't understand. Yeah, I don't know. Like it, but uh, like, sure. <coughs> <coughs> oh, excuse me, while I die real quick. Um, like you know, it's <laughs> obviously the schedule is important, but like, do we really need like it's a two not hour two hours special? special worthy. <laughs> But uh, Eagles schedule they have they start the season with two away games in Washington and KC home opener against the Giants on September twenty fourth. Uh, then the fun part we get LA the one of the LA games we get to go to the Chargers uh, soccer stadium which that's such a <laughs> joke and I, I I can't wait to see how much of a shit show that stadium is. It's gonna be hilarious. Oh, like, yeah. why, why, why would you even bother moving if you're gonna play in a thirty thousand seat soccer stadium? Yeah, I don't. I don't know. Who knows? It's, it's the Chargers. 
It's, it's the NFL. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. then they get the Cardinals <coughs> at home, uh, Panthers away, which is a Thursday night game, then a Monday night game, which, damn, that's actually going to be really nice, the fact that we get that long of a break before the Monday night game in, yeah. uh, especially against, against Washington Especially against the division, yeah. Redskins. That'd be, that'd be a yeah, good Yeah, definitely. Game. Uh, San Fran, Denver, then we get the bye week in week 10, and after the bye week, Sunday night against Dallas. Yeah. <laughs> that, that'll be a good one. Yeah, the, the second half after that bye is pretty, uh, <laughs> that's a tough looking schedule right there. Aside from the Bears and the Rams, yeah. Oh that's, boy. Uh, it's... that's a bit steep. It's a bit steep. Eagles, if you're going to make a playoff rooms, push, yeah. if you're going to make a playoff push, please win the most of your games in the, the before the bye because they really do. They it's need to be tough before the bye. Like they need <laughs> like from the stretch where because because obviously like they could get beat by the Redskins, they could get beat by the the Chiefs, and they can get beat by the, the Giants. So if they if they were to win one of those first three, I think I'd be happy. But then from the stretch where they go from the Chargers. The um, Cardinals, the Panthers, the Redskins, the Niners, and the Broncos, they have to win at least four of those those six. Because Absolutely. after yeah. that bye week, it just we get Dallas Sunday night, like Kyle said, and then we get two games later, we get um, Seattle Sunday night again. Both of those games are away. Um, and then we don't play at home again until the Raiders on Christmas Day, well, Christmas night Which, on ESPN. That's hot awesome. damn, that's going to be that's such awesome. a good game. Yeah, that's really dope. Um, that, that'll be a really, yeah, that'll be a really good game because if both of those teams are in playoff contention like many expect, um, Derek Carr versus Carson Wentz in prime time. On Christmas, on that Christmas is game Day. of the century worthy. Yeah, right there, that'll be awesome. That that'll be a pretty good. Uh, that'll be a pretty good showcase for both of them. I and mean, obviously, you know, everybody knows that both of them are good, but it'll just be. You but know, if they're another, in playoff contention, like it'll yeah, it'll add another level of competitiveness. And it's been a while since we've played the Raiders and actually had like to worry about the Raiders. Like the last yeah. time we did was. Like the seven touchdown game from <laughs> Foles, which, oh, oh boy, that's a while ago. That's yeah. so long ago compared to where we are now. Yeah, the, the, that was when uh, the Raiders were like horrid. So, and now they're going to Las Vegas. We yeah, yeah. <laughs> great job, NFL. And, yeah, just move every team out of their original cities because we just want to make all the monies, all the monies. But, yeah, uh, I'm. I'm still not. Speaking it. of, yeah, the the NFL is a shit show. But uh, then another ridiculous game. Uh, Dallas closed out the season on New Year's Eve. Yeah. <laughs> oh God. Yeah, that'll <laughs> those be those last um, two games are gonna be the most like heart attack inducing games of the year. Oh, without a doubt. Like, even with the Giants added in there because they're our third to last game. So. Yeah. <clears throat> the Rams are gonna give us like. A sigh of relief, and then it's like, okay, <laughs> time, to go, time, time to go to war. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're gonna need like to to make the playoffs. We probably need to win. Like we're gonna need to beat all the division teams at least once to even have a chance. Yeah, and because if any of the teams sweep us, then I don't know. Uh, it'll be, it'll it's gonna be, be hard. Rough. It'll be rough. Yeah, we need to win at least one from all the division opponents. Hopefully, we could we could two zero the Redskins. Um, if we could two of the Giants, that'd be awesome. Um, and then at least take one from the Cowboys, and then because we have the we have the NFC West and the AFC West this year, so uh, and those are pretty tough divisions. <laughs> Which why why do we constantly get screwed by having to play in Seattle <coughs> in Seattle? Like yeah, what, I don't what's know. with that NFL? Who knows? It's just it's you know it's Philly. Like we, we they got to give us yeah. a, they got to give us a hard time for whatever reason. <laughs> Because we threw snowballs at Santa Claus. <laughs> it's the only reason. Pretty much, yeah. Only damn reason. But uh, unless you have anything else to talk about with the Eagles, I think that's pretty much it. No, uh, yeah. Draft's going to be fun, but yeah, it's we're it's still Philly's so time. long away from football it's season. It's Philly's time. It's Philly's time. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, yeah. 
So, out of the Eagles, into the Phillies. So, um, all right, so we'll start off here with some of the recent moves the Phillies have made. So, this was a week ago, but we're not sure. We don't believe we talked about it, so we're just going to say it. If we did talk about it, who cares? We said it again. Um, Alneri Garcia, who is one of the top uh, 30 prospects for the Phillies. I'm not sure exactly what number. He's up there, though. And uh, he is also on the 40-man roster. And he was suspended 80 games for uh, PED use. So he's on the restricted list, which also means that a 40-man roster spot opened up. Um, so we, they, I don't think they have added anybody onto that yet, um, if I'm not mistaken. Because everybody that like is already on it is already getting called up. So they'll have to, if they want to, if they, well, if they, if that's true. If they want to have, like, um, J.P. Crawford up, like, they'll have to add him to the 40-man. So that'll kind of open it, but. It's a, it's a while away, um, but so yeah, so he's on uh, so he's on the restricted list now. Uh, Howie Kendrick, 10-day DL uh, with the right ab strain. Uh, Clay Buckholtz, 10-day DL. He's going to be out probably the whole year, though. Uh, torn flexor tendon, he had surgery. Um, then they signed two guys to minor league deals. Who cares? Uh, <laughs> and then um, <laughs> Mark Leader Jr., they called him up from Lehigh Valley after Buckholtz went down. Uh, well, not after Buckles went down, just when they needed the spot. Um, and then Zach Eflin got called up to make a to make his start in place of Buckles. And then Pat Nishik went on paternity leave. Ben Lively was called up, didn't pitch at all. He, he was here for two days. He's already back. So, yeah, and, and Eflin didn't look too bad in his first start. Um, so you know, some just some just some general transactions going on in the Phillies in the world of the Phillies. Um, I, I, I do like, I honestly, like, I, I, I really, I, I, I want to see what Mark Leader Jr. has, because when he opened up spring training this year, he didn't look too bad. Yeah, and he's been a guy that I've kind of been low-key high on, just from the past, like, two years. Like, he's been solid down in, uh, I think he's gone from Clearwater or, like, Lakewood to Reading, and I, <clears throat> he, I don't think he has spent really any time in... Uh, Lehigh in the past in his career yet I don't unless I'm completely wrong on that but I don't think he's been to Lehigh yet and if he has it's not been for that long but I don't know he's it's just one of those guys where you just kind of want to see what he's what he's got because he's not a top prospect and it's just I don't know he's the son of a former pitcher for um the Mets with Al Leiter and then I don't know he's just a guy <laughs> you kind of just want to see what you have in him and looks like we're going to get a shot to see him eventually uh, maybe if there's like a spot start opening or just if it's a blowout and we have a long relief situation because he started out as a starting pitcher and then they've just kind of tr- uh, transitioned him into a relief pitcher. Yeah, he um he he did well. He played at Lehigh Valley this year. He played he pitched twice. Oh, okay. For five innings, so yeah, not really uh not really much there. But he is now he's is called up, but he'll he'll probably end up going back down to the minors at some point. You'd have to think. Um, Most likely, you know who knows. Who knows if he pitches well, you got to keep him up. Like you, you can't really just send a guy with back our down bullpen. You don't yeah, need <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, just kind of move into some uh, recaps and whatnot, and just some general performance discussion. Um, so they we talked about well we recorded during the Friday game last week against the Nationals. So we'll just start on the Saturday game. Uh, we don't really we don't really need to talk too much about the Sunday game because that was a bit uh <sighs> yeah but um <coughs> but um so yeah so the Phillies won four to two against the Nats on last Saturday the fifteenth uh I believe who made that start Hellickson made that start he went seven it's Jeremy Hellickson he's gonna go seven every time out pretty much it's just if whether or not we can score enough runs or not to to give him um and Cesar Hernandez. Continued his good start to the year. Two hits, two RBI, two runs. Um, one of them was a home run, I believe. Was it? Was that to lead off the game, or was it? Uh no. The Cesar home running in the National Series was. I think it was like an eighth inning home run or something. Oh yeah, it, it was. was it, it was sometime late in the game. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, it was off Joe Bland. That's right. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, because Bland got the loss for it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um. But yeah, so you know, just general performance in that game. Helton pitched well. Um, like we said, Cesar had a had a good game. Um, the bullpen 
was good. Neris, Benoit. Uh, that was the first game Benoit um, was the closer. And uh, <laughs> the only save he got, sadly. But um, Yeah, and then Sunday happened. Yeah, and then, and then Sunday happened. So on Sunday, Kyle, uh, the man that the majority of Phillies fans would rather not sign for whatever reason... <laughs> uh, had five RBI. They had, the Nats scored six runs. And Bryce Harper had five RBI, including two home runs. Um, one, one of them was, was a walk-off. A walk-off three-run home run off of Joaquin Benoit. So, um, so yeah, so that was that was fun. But Cesar, another really good game. At that point, he was hitting three forty six. Uh, he had another home run. Joely Rodriguez, Pat Nishik. They both did fine out of the pen. Eikhoff had an eh start, but it was it was a Jared Eikhoff start, pretty much. Six innings, three runs, five Ks, a walk, and eight hits. That's an Eikhoff start right there. Like, if I've ever seen one, that's an Eikhoff yeah, start. Yeah, that's... <laughs> like, you know what you're going to get out of him. And it's not bad. Like, he's he provides quality starts, and that's <clears throat> better than I can say for Clay Buckles. So... <laughs> that is true. <laughs> but then um, again... Uh, I'm pretty sure anyone could do better than Buckles did in his Yeah, in his short time. Um, but yeah, so then Benoit came in in the ninth, up by two, and gave up a tank of a home run to Bryce Harper, dead center. Uh, they had him 0-2 in the count, too. They they were up 2 or 0-2 yeah. in the count. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, just gave him a cookie, so... Because we can never figure out who, you know, who is the closer of the team, because that's the way of the Phillies. We never have a stable closer unless it's Brad Lidge for one season, and then that's it. Because yeah, because... we only get that kind of look for one year. Yeah. But, okay, before we even talk about anything else, Phillies fans, uh, care to explain yourselves in that CSN poll? <laughs> Just explain to me, what is your rationale behind... Not wanting to sign probably the second best player in baseball in Bryce Harper. Yeah. And if and if Just, you don't know like, what we're explain talking it about, to us. If you don't know what we're talking about. Um, there was a CSN Philly poll. Um, it was it was a few days ago. I think it was like two or three days ago. Um, that said, that asked if um, if you would want the Phillies to sign Bryce Harper. And for who knows what reason. Fifty-three percent of the vote was no, and forty-seven percent of the vote was yes. And um, I'm not um, I'm not too sure. I I really I really really hope that the fifty-three percent was like heavily swayed by a bunch of other fans of other teams, but I I don't think so. <laughs> like I hope to God that that's the reasoning, but I don't think so. Honestly, like Philly fans are crazy enough to say. Oh, no, he's, like, a national. Why would we want to sign him? Yeah, his, his hair annoys me, so I don't want to sign him. Like, <laughs> you know what? <laughs> yeah, his hair is annoying as shit, and he is, a, he is the definition of a douche nozzle. But if you want <laughs> he's also the second best player in the game. game. And so, if you want him to be, like, a non-Philly killer, then why would you not want him on the Phillies? He says he loves hitting at our... At our ballpark, why would you not want him on our team? <laughs> Guess what? If he plays for the Phillies, he gets to play 81 games in our ballpark. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. Probably the MVP, like unanimous MVP. Yeah. But, I mean, well, Mike Trout exists, so that he might not be unanimous, but still. Maybe like, the NL MVP, <laughs> so, yeah. Ex- oh, yeah, duh, because I <laughs> forget that there's a difference. Um, but, yeah, I, I don't understand it, and I'm never going to, like... I saw some people saying, like, oh, well, it's so we can spread the money out more evenly and get, like, Machado and get so these, these like, these other pieces. And I'm like, it's not an either-or okay. thing. Like, you, we could get both. Yeah. That's the thing. Like, we have all the money in the world. And, okay, I, hmm. If I have to choose between getting Machado or Harper, just based on the team's needs at the time, like, okay, if Michael Franco turns into a, like, MVP, oh, like, I don't know if he could even, like, ever turn into an MVP, but if he can get to, like, 30 home runs a year and 
hitting like two. Basically, with the plate. Yeah, like basically what we had in a, like a Roland back in the nineties. If we if he could get to that, and if no, you know what? I'm not gonna go finish that because I was saying, oh well, you could just move him to first then, and we could get rid of uh, Joseph. But Reese Hoskins is a thing, so no, yeah, get Harper. Yeah. Like, I that's thing. I I'm trying to rationale it, and I'm just like, no, that it still doesn't make sense. Like, I I love Machado, and like, and if it was any other draft class or any other free agent class, I'd be like, yeah, sign Machado oh, a within a second. But Harper is there. Yeah, and like, even if we get Harper, like the chance that we sign Machado isn't completely out of the question either, because our ownership group and our management group has said. Like, we will spend when the time is right. Like, like we already, we, we had a really, really, really team-friendly contract with Adubel Herrera. He's the only player signed past this year. And so, we know that we're going to have the money when the time comes. And so, when that time does come, and Bryce Harper and Manny Machado are on the market and predicted to break shatter records with how much money they're going to be making. We, we're we going to have the money to spend, and we're going to spend it. So, like, if we can get both, like, you never know. We might need Machado because Franco doesn't pan out. God forbid J.P. Crawford keeps slumping and just turns into <laughs> whoever, Don Brown. Uh, oh, God. Yeah. But, you know, you don't, never don't know. Even, don't even say that. I know, I'm, yeah. But you never know, like it, stuff like that, stuff yeah. like that could happen. Where if we sign both, it'll be fine. But I don't know. It, like if I was given the option between Harper and Machado in a draft, I would probably nine times out of ten go Harper. Yeah, and I think that's. Well, I would say that's the majority of Phillies fans, but obviously that would not be the case because we don't want Bryce Harper. <laughs> um, but yeah, and you're right about the whole J.P. Crawford thing because I didn't even think about this. Machado can play short, mm-hmm. like. If worse comes to worse and JP doesn't turn out, um, okay, imagine that infield, Franco, Machado, um, Kingery, and Hoskins. That would be a fun Um, We win fun the World time. Series with that infield alone. Mm-hmm. And if you add Harper and, like, Roman <laughs> Quinn, Odubel, Altair, Williams. I don't see how we lose, honestly. Probably go 162 and 0. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I then like the rotation we'll have by then. We'll have Nola. We'll have uh, Jake Thompson, Franklin Colomb, <laughs> Eflin might still be in there. Sixto Sanchez. Uh, Sixto, yeah. Sixto and Sixto is looking so good. Oh like, my god! Uh, yeah. If you if you don't follow Matt uh, Matt Winkleman, please do because he gave like an update of the one day on um, <laughs> Sixto's start, and it was just like, yeah, he's barely throwing like any pitches per inning. Like, he's just dominating out there, and it's just like, <laughs> please come to the Phillies yeah, soon. And, well, and, you know, <laughs> we need and you. Also, we have him, uh, a really good start to the year, Nick Pavetta. Um, fantastic start boy. to the year. Fantastic start to the year. Uh, he had another stellar performance. He, he set his career high in strikeouts. I believe he struck out 11 over 7 innings on 90 or 80-something. I think it was like 90-something pitches, but um, yeah, he's... You know, some of the minor leaguers have been having really good years, and then some of them have been having not so great years. But um, to move into the Mets series, um, so to open the series, uh, Zach Eflin got his start, first start of the year. Uh, first time, pretty much, that he's been healthy um, because he's always had those knee problems. And... Uh, Basically, just leg problems in general, and he had uh, he had a, a decent start. He he started out shaky. Uh, Cam Rupp kind of screwed him over a little bit because he was calling some trash pitches because he's Cam Rupp. Um, <laughs> and yeah, he went five though. He went five innings, two runs, four Ks, three walks. Um, not too bad of a performance. Um, the offense kind of helped him out a little bit. They scored six runs. Uh, Odubel had a home run, and uh, Andres Blanco had a double. Uh, there was five different players with RBI. Daniel Nav had two. Uh, the bullpen was good as well. All shutout innings, only three base runners. Uh, Edubre Ramos gave up a hit, and then Luis Garcia and 
Benoit both walked the hitter. But other than that, nothing. Uh, five Ks from the bullpen combined over five innings uh, of scoreless ball. So that game was that game was a good game to watch. And the best thing about it was Jose Reyes cost the Mets the game. Yes, he did. He dropped a... <laughs> the most easy pop-up I think I've ever seen. And Jose Reyes, like, you could tell Darno was just like, well, what the fuck are you doing, bro? Like, <laughs> how'd you miss that? I, I thought you had it, bro. Yeah, and like the... Just... Um, and then the whole thing with with uh, Freddie Galvis and how he didn't run it. But, you know, it all, it all worked out in the end, so it's fine. It's fine. Um... If it, if it hadn't worked out in the end, that'd be a bit of a different story, but... Yeah. <laughs> but it worked out, so... We might be a little bit more mad at Freddy. Yeah, but it, it worked out, so... Yeah, we might be just like... If that if that didn't work out, we might be just... Just pitchforking for JP at this point, who cares? Um, <laughs> uh, and then... In the second game of the series, on the 19th, uh, they lost that game because... Apparently, Jay Bruce, like, decided to... Become the Philly killer again um, because he's been just killing us lately. Uh, he went three for four, five RBI, all on home <laughs> runs. Uh, he had a three run and then a two run. And the three run was against Vince Velasquez, who had a very good start up until that point. Um, even though he only had two strikeouts, Vince Velasquez. Uh, yes, that's right. Vince Last has only had two strikeouts. But, um, overall, a really good start. Um, just that one pitch to Jay Bruce and a, a few lingering at-bats here and there kind of kind of cost him a, a seven-inning performance. But, you know, you, 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 we, we'll take what we get out of, out of Vince Velasquez, especially six innings. That, that's fine. Um, and then Ramos came in and gave up the two-run shot to... to uh, to uh, Jay Bruce in the eighth, but you know, overall, Velasquez not a bad performance on the offensive end, at least. Uh, well, on the offensive end, Michael Franco at five on base, um, so that wasn't good. Yeah, it wasn't the best of days for Mike, <laughs> but he made up for in a third game. Oh, without a doubt, definitely made up for the third game uh, because <laughs> he turned up on April the twentieth. Also known as 420. Um, so he went two for Blaze four. It. What? Oh, it was a <laughs> oh, <Blaze Blaze it. laughs> wow. Uh, this is a children's <laughs> program, Kyle. No, um, but he <laughs> but he went two for four. Uh, Franco did with a double and a home run. Uh, he had two RBI, and well, the home run was was launched. Um, the whole, well, it was a missile, like, it hit the, at yeah, the Mets, was... they have the dumb thing where it's like, it could hit the, the wall and then come back into play and it's a home run. They're dumb, it's the Mets, yeah, like, it's, <laughs> we, we expect this kind of stupidity from them at this point. Yeah. Uh, Nola had a good start, um, five innings, four runs, there was, <laughs> there were a few innings, Andrew Knapp kinda screwed him over in the first, in the second inning, sorry. Um, Noah Syndergaard was at the plate, and, uh, I believe he was up to o two 2 in the count, Nola was. And at this point, Nola was at, I don't even know, I, I think it was like 20, it was either 26, 27, or 28 pitches. So you gotta figure, that's a really good pitch count through two innings. Um, especially when the 8 hitter, because Syndergaard hits 8th. Um, I, I'm not even sure if all of my pitchers do, but... For a twenty high mid to high twenty pitch count in the second inning with the eight hitter up is is good, and then ended up walking Cindergard and then they kind of got a rally going. I don't think they ended up scoring off it. They might have scored a run, but like he ended up getting up into like the forties in his pitch count and um, yeah, but they did score a run. But um, you know, it, just that one inning kind of not screwed him over, but. It, it tacked it down a lot. Of, yeah, it tacked down a lot of extra pitches, which led to the third inning. Which, huh, of course, just I think it was just like the similar situation. Nola, like when I saw Nola the box score for the game, and I saw Nola, Nola only had two strikeouts. I was like, I swear he had more strikeouts, and then I realized, no, he just had like fifty oh and oh two counts, and then for some reason they just kept trying to paint the corners with everything. And it led to a lot of walks that shouldn't have happened. 
And also, Yoda Cespedes was such a pain in the ass in this <laughs> game. The first at bat he had, Nola had Nola was on pace for like a ten pitch inning, and then Cespedes just fouled off like at least like five pitches in a row, and then just the pitch was literally like as far down as it could possibly get, and like far out of the zone, and Cespedes just dunks it in for a hit. Like I think it was over, I think that was the one that was over Cesar, which I was just screaming like run back, and Cesar just keeps backpedaling like I got this, I got this, and I don't got this. <laughs> Because <laughs> yeah. Cesar Hernandez, everyone. Uh, <laughs> you know, he, you can't really you can't really blame him that much now because he's he's been good. He's been the best hitter, so can't even yeah. say anything about it. But uh, my third inning, Neil Walker hits a home run, and I don't know if you saw this, but I saw a lot of people complaining like about Nola. That pitch was in the dirt. And Neil yeah. Walker somehow just gulfs it out. Like, that's not on Hinola. Like, he made a perfect pitch. And he got Walker to chase. Neil and Walker just, just turned into... F- yeah, like... It, there's no way you can fall Nola for that. And if you do, I don't really understand your reasoning at all. Yeah. Please explain it to me. Yeah, but then after that, uh, the Phillies score... Well, pretty much all the scoring was at the beginning of the game. It was it was 5-4 Phillies after 3. Uh, and then the Phillies ended up tacking on run in the eighth on a Michael Franco home run. Um, but the bullpen was good. Um, Joel Rodriguez, Hector, uh, sorry, uh, Joaquin Benoit, and then Neris saved it. Um, <coughs> we haven't seen Jemar Gomez in a while. Um, I wonder why, but, <laughs> you know. It might be that 11-some ERA that he's got. I'm, I'm just taking a wild guess. <laughs> That's... That might have something to do with it. Um, you know, when you're, generally when you're pitching, you probably don't want to give up runs or else you won't pitch. But, yeah. Um, That's a bold strategy there. <laughs> but, yeah, so that... What I've been noticing out of the bullpen, I don't know. Like, there have been games where the bullpen just looks like, unhittable, but then there's also games where, you know, they'll, it's been, they've been a lot better of late, I will say that. But there are games where, you know, Joelle will have an off game. Uh, Adubre Ramos will have an off game. Hector Neris hasn't given up, on a, hasn't given up a run yet. So, he'll, you, know, we, we, you know he'll be fine. Uh, Benoit, he's I'm been just good. I'm going to wood for that. Benoit has been good for the most part. But uh, he just had that one blown save against the Nats, um, which obviously stung a lot. But for the most part, I mean, most of the bullpen has been pretty good. They've been picking it up a little bit lately. Um, you see, you're seeing a lot more quick innings. I think Joelle got through two innings on like less than 20 pitches yesterday, so that was a good that was a good uh, outing for him. Uh, he's brought his uh, ERA down because his ERA was up in the mid teens or something. Yeah, it was. Now it's down to like 6.75, which for early season isn't terrible. It'll it'll come down a lot. Um, yeah, but. <coughs> But uh, overall, just kind of hitting. Uh, right now, we got Aaron Altair up there hitting 333 with a home run, four ribbies. What we were looking at before was Cesar has already struck out 20 times as compared to five walks. But he does have 20 hits, 13 runs scored, and he's tied for the team lead with home runs. So who knows with Cesar Hernandez. And somehow Michael Franco has more walks than Cesar, which I did not think I would say at any point during the season. <laughs> But look at look at where we yeah. are. So and then you had Odubel <laughs> just <laughs> being Odubel nine walks and uh, only fourteen strikeouts. So <laughs> yeah, he's so. he's being Odubel. Yeah, Odubel's being Odubel. Cam Rupp somehow has six walks uh, as well. Um, you I know, s- I still think MLB.com is lying with that. <laughs> they have to be. Like I swear to God, Cam Rupp doesn't get on base. And what we were also extremely mind blown over is the fact that Michael Saunders is hitting 265 um, and has 13 hits because prior to recording we were talking a little bit about kind of the stats and we, we, we were going to be like talking about for the Phillies and we were like wait Michael Saunders is hitting 265 higher than Odubel and has one fewer hit than him um what? <laughs> I, I still need a clarification on that because how I, I've, he doesn't like. There's just no way. Every, 
I don't, I don't understand. Yeah, like he's tied. When for, does he get these hits? For third on the team in hits, and I swear that every time I watch the game, he doesn't get. A, I swear, I he doesn't get. He doesn't hit. But who knows? You know. I mean, he's only got two walks. So I mean that, and like eleven strikeouts. So that might be part of it. But still, like, yeah. where do those hits come from? Like, is it all like in blowouts where it's like the. Seventh inning and like fifth inning on or whatever, and the game's already like we've reached the point of no return where we're just kind of like uh, Walking Dead watching the game. Like, uh, yeah, doesn't have a home run though, <laughs> so we definitely need him to hit some more of those. But yeah, that's kind of what he's here for for the most part. Like he's a power guy, and it would be nice to see him start to hit them. But I I feel like he's I, don't know, I, I still have a lot of faith in Saunders to be a decent player for the team. And again, it's not like he's going to be on the team long term. He's probably traded at the deadline. Hopefully, he can just get it going, just so he can increase that draft stock or draft stock. Jesus Christ, uh, trade stock. <laughs> this is not the Eagles I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. Um, hopefully, but you know, you never know. Hopefully, he does get it going because, like Kyle said, not only will it in- improve his trade stock if we were to trade him. That is. Because I'm pretty sure we do have an option on him for next year. Um, yep. Yeah. But also, we kind of need some power in the middle of the lineup besides Michael Franco, who is producing it, but producing it, um, you know, not as often as we would like him to. So, yeah, and, and, when, and when Cesar Hernandez is tied for the team lead in home runs, that's just, no. That's, that's not a good sign. But yeah, definitely not the best of signs, but... Um, it's early. Yeah, it's, it's early. early. They're starting a three-game series against the Braves tonight. Uh, we're recording this Friday. They're uh, starting a three-game series against the Braves. Helixson versus Cologne, game one. Um, the lineup is pretty much the exact same it has, as it has been all year, um, except for... The fact that uh, Freddie Galvis has moved from the eight hole to the seven hole, and Cam has been slotted down to the eight, and uh, Aaron Altair, obviously starting for Javi Kendrick, who's out, he's been starting um, and left the last few games um, as Howie is on the DL. And then uh, game two, we're gonna have Ikov versus Garcia, and then game three, Zach Eflin's gonna make his second start against Mike. Your guess is as good as mine. I think it's. <laughs> Fult- to Fulton Fulton Nevich, maybe? I think it's uh Foldnowitz or something Who like knows? that. Um it's Shorten your name, bro. We can't we can't <laughs> say that. Um yeah, so who knows? Hopefully uh, they could take that series because that will move them into fourth at least in the east. Um and then maybe they can like catch the Marlins or something. Uh, but, you know, probably not. Because they're, they're the Phillies, and they <laughs> hate to, like, have fun, so. The Phillies hate fun. That is the moral of... I think we can just say, like, Philly sports hates fun. I think that's just the moral of the podcast. Pretty much, yeah. Like, hey, let's not sign Bryce Harper so we have stuff to complain about, you know? So we can sign... Uh, who, who else is a free agent that year? It's like... I, don't know, I have no idea. Just someone that's not as good as Bryce Harper, which is AKA like every other person on there besides Bryce Harper and like Manny Machado. Yeah, pretty much. But so that is basically it for Phillies. Uh, we'll have a little bit more stuff on like the minor leagues next week. Uh, Jared's probably gonna do like a minor league recap uh, for like the first month, and we'll do kind of a just a month recap. Let's focus less so on the games of the past week just because it'll be the last episode of april um do like a standings recap on the uh, the whole mlb most likely we'll have uh just some like stat recap see who's performing who isn't and yeah so that is basically it for the phillies unless you have anything else to add yeah that's it all right so on to the hot take segment i have it this week of course since i introed for the podcast this week, and I kind of have like a two-parter, but one's just like a quick one that is just kind of me being like, fuck off to this person, and then there's an actual hot take. <laughs> but, uh, so, first of all, <coughs> fuck, fuck the dude from Oklahoma, Joe Mixon. I don't want him anywhere near this team, and I 
just no. F- fuck that dude. I know so many people are like, oh well, like they, him and the girl that he punched released a joint statement today, which, ooh, big surprise, they released a joint statement like the week before the draft. <laughs> Nothing coincidental, coincidental about that at all. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I just don't like Joe Mixon. He's a, he's a dick. Um, but for my actual hot take. I say the NFL is the worst overall league in sports. Just out of the four major sports leagues, I think it's the absolute worst. I can see where you're coming from on that. Um, it's I, honestly like for the NFL, it's either like you love it or you don't. Like I don't know. There, I don't think there's like a happy medium. Obviously, there's exceptions. There's people that you know they'll they'll sit and they'll watch maybe a few games, but like for the most part. People are gonna either sit there and watch all sixteen or close to all sixteen, and they're or they're not just gonna watch at all. So, and plus, like you know, it, Roger Goodell is the commissioner, and yeah, <laughs> yeah. I would rather. Good lord. I would rather like <coughs> literally anybody else run the league. Like I could think of. Yeah, I. Like I can't think of anybody that I would rather not run that league than Roger Goodell. So Yeah, he is easily the worst commissioner in baseball. Like or commissioner in baseball. <laughs> F- for fuck's sake. <laughs> um worst commissioner in sports. Mm-hmm. Again, I d- apparently don't have any talking ability this week. <laughs> um yeah, he's a, like I was talking about this with a few people earlier today and it's amazing how the NFL cuz the thing came out about Ruben Foster and I know some people have been saying, like, oh, apparently he's done, like, weed or whatever. And, okay. If a player does weed, yeah, I, I I get the why people are upset with it. But it's the fact that the NFL has put forward suspending players for weed. Like, Josh Gordon has been basically banned from the NFL. And granted, he's done it, like, a million times, even though he's been told to, you know, Stop it. not do it. And he's an idiot for that. But it's the fact that he gets basically banned from the league because of it, while Greg Hardy can just roam free and just kind of dick around, literally just dick around. Like, wh- how? Yeah. Why are sexual assaulters, why are rapists, why are murderers like Ray Lewis and rapists like Ben Roethlisberger allowed to just roam free and have fun in the league while Josh Gordon gets banned for getting high? Like, that's such a, I hate, I hate the backward ways of the NFL <laughs> and Roger Goodell. Yeah, the the NFL's policy on everything is reversed. Like you were saying, like Josh Gordon was well, he has he has the ability to to come back with the team or whatever, but um he's like the NFL has pretty much done everything in their power to keep him out of the league for as long as they possibly can. Um and like you said, like with all the domestic abuse and everything going on outside and off the field, it's just and they're like I remember like it all started with the Ray Rice thing when that yeah that Ray was Rice the... thing came out and he only got what did he like, I think he only got a four game suspension. I yeah actually I, I think for, so I for, I think and... it was a four game suspension and I remember like everybody was just they just went berserk over that. Um, and then and the video and came out later. And that's when it all got revealed, and, basically. Yeah. And, like, that was just it. And then now, pretty much any time there's a video out of something like this, or not even a video, but just multiple witnesses or multiple victims, like, you are you should be, at least, like, not necessarily, don't get me wrong, not banned from the league. Because that I don't think that there's anything that you could do that would get you banned from the... Except, unless you, like, murdered somebody. So, in Aaron Hernandez's case, you're banned from the league. Or Ray Lewis, somebody because, like that. Yes. Know. But, I don't think, like... Like, obviously, domestic abuse is such a... Sh- such a cowardly thing to do, and it's such a, a... Just an absolute... Top priority issue. But, I don't think it's, like, necessary to ban somebody from the league because of that. Like, sure, it's a such a, a screwed up thing to do and everything but um it's not bannable but the thing is like they need to do more than they have been doing they're giving out like ha- like half season suspensions 
or like a few game suspensions for this stuff. Um, and like I'm not, I'm not even gonna say it's just the NFL, like the MLB, like with Ho- with like yeah. Jose Reyes and everything, um, and uh, Juris Familia. Like Familia was suspended 15 games for what he did, which, which is, is nothing. <laughs> um, Chat Rollis like Chapman of the year. was I, I forgot what he I, he was definitely hit for more. I think it was for 40 last year or something, maybe 30, but. It was, yeah, it was something like that. <coughs> but <coughs> it's really just not enough. And they, like you said, like they need to, they need to start cracking down on it a lot more. It's the fact that, like you said, they have done everything in their power to make sure Josh Gordon never plays another NFL game, but they don't do the same for guys like Ray Rice yeah. or Greg Hardy or Roethlisberger or any of the other 50 million freaking NFL players who have done this. And that's where like, it gets me because... Like, and I get your point, though, like, it, there's very few things that should result in a ban, but if you're gonna go out of your way to essentially ban Josh Gordon for just something as simple and as petty as weed, which, hey, is legal in some states, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, everyone seems to forget that when the NFL did that. It's like, hey, you do know that weed is actually, you know, illegal and is, is legal in some yeah. states. It's, it's not like it's this forbidden thing now. But meanwhile, for domestic abuse, they just domestic. I like. I think this is their rationale for domestic abuse. They go, yeah, that's really bad. But we put pink thing. We we put like pink on everything in October, <laughs> so we care about women. Yeah. Like, <laughs> look, we care about women. We made everything pink. Like, no, that's not how it works. I don't. That's that's just not how it works, guys. Yeah, and like. To kind of go, like, just to kind of, like, whatever, but, um, to say what your Joe Mixon thing, I would not take Joe Mixon if he, w- if, don't, like, literally the only circumstance that I would take Joe Mixon is if he was there in, like, the sixth round. And that, and I get that. might like, be, like, a sh- like, he's not gonna be there because there's gonna be a team that's gonna take him. Um. The Cowboys will take him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Unless, like, unless there was a development with him, I'm not sure if you saw, about, like, a high school incident or whatever, but, um, so if that comes out to be true and it's before the draft, then I don't even see how he gets drafted, honestly. But as it stands now, and like you said, like, sure, it's really, really, really coincidental that they kind of made that joint statement right before the draft, but... Um, at this point, I don't think, I think he will get drafted, but if that high school incident ordeal comes true, then I don't think he will be. Um, but like you said, I, I wouldn't draft him probably at all, unless it was really late in the draft, because like, I'm not going to turn down a talent that high and that good just because of his past. And sure, it's a shitty, shitty past, but... I don't know. I believe in second chances to an extent, but I don't know. I don't know how I would feel doing it early on rather than late. Yeah, it's... I don't know. I Just from my personal opinion, I just wouldn't even want him anywhere near it. And like, no matter what, like, it would take a lot. And it's, it's the fact that he did it and the fact that he hasn't really shown any remorse about it. There was an interview. I don't know how old this interview is. It might have been, like, a decent while ago but someone asked him like oh how does this uh suspension like what has the impact of it been and he he just had like the most like smug like i don't really give a shit like i'm just he literally said i'm just here to answer football questions he p- tried to pull like a marshawn lynch or some shit but you don't get to do that you beat you beat a woman like marshawn lynch just didn't want to deal with the media's bs you have a responsibility to own up to your to what you did, and as far as I've, as far as I know, he hasn't done that. I don't. I may have just missed something. Like he may have actually, you know, really come forward and been like, "Yeah, I'm a really shitty person for doing that." And but I, again, I don't know. And like you said, second chances are a thing. I do believe in them. And a lot of people have tried to pull like, "Oh well, Mike Vick was, you know, we had to give him a second chance." Okay, <laughs> what Mike Vick did and what Joe Mixon did to just entirely different things and they should not be compared in really any way shape or form but again like i second chances are a thing <coughs> and if 
again, if Mixon comes forward and he actually seems remorseful about what he did, and he seems like he gives, he actually gives a shit and will, you know, show that he's going to be a better person, then yeah, you're, I'm going to be open to it because it's, I don't know, it's just what should, should happen for a player who actually does show remorse. But that's just my take on it. It's a weird, it's an it's annoying subject because it happens so often with a lot of college players and just a lot of college um, students in general, even if you're not an athlete, which is really shitty. But it's very prevalent in football, and football handles it Poorly. worse than any other league. Well, without a doubt worse. But, uh... So that's kind of a really depressing way to end the podcast. Yeah, but, you know. But, uh... Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's it's real. But life. next week we'll have fun things. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we got some. We'll, we'll be talking some minor league stuff next week. So hopefully, uh, they hopefully JP Crawford is hitting above one hundred at this time next week. Yeah, please, just just <laughs> do, do us a favor, JP. Give us something to be happy about. Yeah, and if you <laughs> and if not, yeah, and if you are going to be going to a Lehigh Valley game, please look at the good fight. Uh, on their website, and then look at the article that they gave suggestions for signs, and just bring a sign and have it for JP because he needs some. He needs some. He needs some uplifting at this point because he's he's got he got off to a tough start after being like one of the most hyped prospects in all of baseball over the last three years. So, so just, you know, if you're gonna be going to a Lehigh Valley game, bring a sign and cheer for JP Crawford. Or just tweet at him and just be like, "Hey, we believe in you," because we need to. Yeah. <laughs> we need we need to believe in yeah, you. Exactly. He's twenty one uh, years old. Like yeah. we need to believe. In exactly, and he still has all the talent in the world. So give JP your support. That's your mission. And hey, another thing you could do: tweet us your best. You tweet us signs that you make for JP Crawford. Why not? Just tweet us that too. Tweet us at us and JP. Bring him to Iron Pigs games. Do all of that. And it'll be a fun time. JP will, JP will greatly appreciate it. Very much, yeah. But uh, so that has been the thirteenth episode of the Drive Podcast. I am Kyle Fry, and I again I can't do fucking outros. This has been Jerry Powell and Kyle <laughs> Fry. There we go. That's a little bit better. We will see you next week for episode fourteen. Have a good hey, day, everyone. Listening. They do. Fly ball left field. Tagging from third is Suarez. Goodell comes running in. He's under it. Makes the catch. Here's the throw to the plate. It's in the air. He is out! Cameron Rick hangs on! Oh man, what a play! Cameron Rick hangs on! Wow. Everybody to their feet. What a play by Cameron Rupp. The throw took him into the baseline. He grabs it, hangs on, takes the contact, and the ball game is over. Another one-run victory. Now they are going to review this to see if there was a violation of the whole